Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much to the organizers and to ESUS for this um, lovely conference and the invitation. So for I'm going to talk. What? For the weather. And the weather. <laughs> it's going to improve. <laughs> exactly. Right, there's a motivation to come inside. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about Einstein equations. I'm going to introduce some geometry into our PDEs. And of course, we all heard about the detection of gravitational waves. So it was confirmed in February this year that it was detected last year in September. And I'd like to make a connection to, let's say, geometric analysis and what we know from the PD point of view, analyzing the Einstein equations. What can we see about gravitational radiation <coughs> from the mathematical point of view? So basically, I'm going to talk, introduce first, well, what do we mean by space-time? What are the Einstein equations? And so again, this will be a point of view of PD of this hyperbolic set of PDEs from a geometric um, viewpoint. I'm going to make a connection with, so what do we mean by energy in GR, general relativity? Um, so this may be not a straightforward straightforward notion to think of from the beginning, so we have to think about it a little bit. I will talk about what I will call null infinity. So let me just very heuristically motivate this for the moment. So if we think of gravitational radiation, so they are produced during the merger of compact binaries like black holes, for instance. So there's something happening here. We have two bodies, black holes, spiraling in. They lose energy into the gravitational field, so they radiate waves. And these waves will travel at the speed of light along so-called null hypersurfaces. So you can think of this as a generalization of a light cone, basically. So this will go along null hypersurfaces. Um, let's say when we are far away, let, when t goes to infinity, so we can think of what, what, uh, where we are sitting in an experiment. So this is null infinity. So we will look at null infinity. That's where um, we are sitting when we're doing experiments and we are looking backwards in time along these null hypersurfaces. So we would like to understand from a point of view of analysis and geometry, how does our space time look, uh, look like out here? And what kind of information can you gain from what's happening in the past here, for instance, in such a source? I will explain this a little bit more later. And well, of course, gravitational waves will also address something called the memory effect. That's a permanent change of the space time by the gravitational waves. And we also hope that this will be de detected in the near future. And detection is one thing we hope, of course, for the future, that this will be a new tool to really learn about other parts of the universe where telescopes cannot see. OK, I'll then address some um, results in the asymptotically flat case. So that's where we look at galaxies, for instance, or we think we are here, the galaxy creates curvature, but far away, the next galaxy is so far away, so we can assume the space-time is flat far away. Another setting is the cosmological setting, when we look at the whole space-time, the whole history of the universe, what can we say there? Well, first of all, what is the space-time? So we look at the Einstein equation, so on the left-hand side, and I'm going to talk about four dimensions, so three plus one, three spatial one-time dimension. So we look on the left hand side, so we have basically the geometric objects, if you like. So we have the Ricci curvature, the metric, we are solving for the metric, the scalar curvature, and we call this G muni on the left hand side, the Einstein tensor. And on the right hand side, so we plug in the so-called energy momentum tensor. So whenever you have electric fields present or a fluid or anything else, that is not given by gravity on the left hand side. So you plug it into the energy momentum tensor and you have also to supply the corresponding uh, equations. So for instance, if you have electric electromagnetic fields, you couple your Einstein with the Maxwell equations and you get the coupled Einstein-Maxwell system. So we are solving the Einstein equations for the metric, We'd like to create the space time, either locally or globally in time. And well, we'll see. So, it's possible now to, I mean, if you have the Einstein equations, we usually write them as, well, if you look at it this way, it looks nice and compact, uh, but we usually write them as a system of hyperbolic uh, nonlinear PDE. And, well, if you add the cosmological term, so 
how does cosmology come in? Well, Einstein in the first, in 1915, had written down his equation without this cosmological term, but then he wanted to study cosmology and he was actually looking for a static universe at the time. He didn't believe in anything that's moving. The universe had to be static. And to counteract gravity, he then plucked in this lambda term, which is giving you an expansion, basically. So he got the static universe by doing that. But for all purposes now, so we think since the 1998 uh, observations that our universe is ex actually expanding at the accelerated rate. And this is modeled then by this lambda term. Okay. And often I will just look, look at the Einstein vacuum equation. So if the right hand side your team you knew is zero, the Einstein equation is reduced to the Ricci scalar of the full space time being zero. And you, there's already a lot of interesting information or questions you can ask about just the Einstein vacuum equations themselves. Okay, well, first of all, um, in order to study anything that has to do with real physics, we would like to do uh, a mathematically rigorous problem, of course. You have to study the Cauchy problem. So it all starts with the Cauchy problem for the Einstein equations. And as most of the audience is not working in GR, with some experts as an exception, so let me review a little bit what does it mean um, to set up the Cauchy problem for the Einstein equations. So it's a bit different uh, in, in various uh, ways. So an initial data set, what is that in GR? So we think, first of all, of a three-dimensional manifold. So you can think of t equals zero. You get a Riemannian uh, complete manifold. If you look at asymptotically flat, for instance, that you're interested in. So you get a complete Riemannian metric, the induced metric on the initial hypersurface. And we specify a symmetric two tensor, k. Maybe I'm going to write it down. And if you have anything on the right-hand side present, so other matter fields, you also specify, of, co of course, these equations. Now, the Einstein equations couple into two sets of equations. One is the constrained equations, which the initial data has to satisfy. And the other set of equations are the evolution equations, the ones you then solve into the future. And so the constrained equations, it's, you cannot just pick any initial data, but it has to uh, fulfill these constraints, and only then you can think about doing an, uh, uh, an evolution problem. And then a Cauchy development of such data is given as a globally hyperbolic spacetime of this sort, verifying the Einstein equations and the embedding given as these things. So maybe just to um, say at time equals zero, so we think of some space-like hypersurface H, zero for instance, G bar and K, and this initial data has to satisfy the constraints. And so if I have a time vector field, I can introduce that. So this k is going to be the second fundamental form with respect to t then. Well, um, let me first talk about asymptotically flat systems as I just motivated a few minutes ago. So if you look at what happens, for instance, within a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, you think the next object is so far away, you think your space, space time is going to be flat very far to uh, very far away. So what does that mean? So we think of asymptotically flat initial data in the sense that outside of a sufficiently large compact set, so <coughs> H without K is diffeomorphic to the complement of a closed ball in R3. So and then the G bar, the initial, well, the, the metric G bar and K have to decay G bar to delta IJ and k to zero fast enough. And of course, I will make this more precise. So what type of decay, what type of asymptotically flat data we are looking at? <coughs> so let me first say that, well, if you look at, at the history of general relativity, and so the Einstein equations were put out there in 1915, and it took, well, there were many, many things happening in between in math and physics, but it took you know, until the 1950s and 60s where Yvonne Jacques Bruyat and her and Bob Garage actually really solved the well poseness for the Einstein equations. If you look at, um, for instance, in 1919, we have Eddington's experiment um, confirming the bending of light, etc. You have on the physics side of GR many of these big things that happened or the expansion of the universe found by Lemaitre in 1927. So all these things who have many of these successes and mathematically you could ask, well, what's been going on mathematically? There were many people actually working, um, like Lure, Schauder, many people looking at the uh, initial value problem, but it's not that easy to figure out what should be exactly the right way to put up the initial value problem. 
So I'm skipping all this history, but it's actually interesting to read up on that. So there's many people who contributed in many ways. So basically in 1952, that's the first rigorous general mathematical theorem in terms of well postness. So Yvon Jacquebriand then showed that if you take HG bar k as such an initial data set, which is, va um, well, here this is formulated for the vacuum Einstein equations, but it's been generalized to hold for most um, other field fields on the right hand side. So then there exists a space-time satisfying the Einstein vacuum equations with H into M being a space-like surface with induced metric G bar and second fundamental form K. And then the general form of what, so whenever you do a, a, a pro, um, solve the Einstein equations, so basically you go back to one form of, of, the, um, of these well postness results lo uh, for these local results. So then the other formulation is given here. So Choque, Yvonne Choquebriand and Bob Gerasch in 1969 then came up with this formulation of the well postness. Okay, so that's the first rigorous step in, a, in, in, a, in general, I would say. Well, let me say something about energy in GR. Well, most of us, well, when we think about PDE, so often we need to find, of course, energies that have to be controlled to get control on the solutions of, of our, our uh, equations, etc. So if you think of doing something like that in GR and you, do, you take the most naive approach, so things might fail. So what's the problem here? So one problem or interesting feature is that if I'm sitting at the point in, G in GR, I can actually transform away the gravitational field. So it just I can, by transformation, I can make it zero. So how would you define energy at the point if you can actually transform away the field there? Well, that's one problem. So you can think, well, maybe I don't look at the point. Maybe I go a little bit further. Maybe I integrate over a sphere, something quasi-local. Well, it turns out that's one thing we can do, but also for asymptotically flat systems, for instance, what's been understood quite well for a lot of interesting space times is you can integrate, for instance, over a space-like slide slice, or you can also look at what's the, if you integrate locally over a sphere and you get some mass or energy, um, well, expression, and you can take the limit, like the Hawking mass, I'm going to write that down later, and you take the limit to null infinity, there's something else called the Bondi mass, for instance, that will show up later. And um, So there are mass and energy definitions for certain, actually many interesting space times that we understand. But let me give you maybe a little bit of an idea of the confusion at the beginning by citing Einstein and one of his colleagues. So Einstein formulated some sort of an energy momentum theorem very early actually for his for a closed universe and so most of his colleagues at the time did not agree with it and here is what um, what he says so here this is a citation while the general relativity theory was approved by most theoretical physicists and mathematicians almost all colleagues object to my formulation of the energy momentum theorem I'm not going to go into details but he wanted some kind of an energy momentum conservation for some closed universe but Turns out that's maybe not the right way to do it. And so this is um, Einstein with Georges Lemaitre. Uh, maybe a side note, this is actually Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian mathematician and physicist who, fa who derived from the Einstein equations and Slipher's observations in 1927 that the universe is expanding. It was not Hubble. Hubble had a paper two years later and he never talked about an expanding universe. Okay. Let's still stay a little bit more with energy and conservation. So what, what do we know? So we can look at the Bianchi identity that we know from geometry and apply it here to the Riemannian curvature <coughs> tensor. And well, we take, for instance, twice contracted Bianchi, Bianchi identity and get this equation on the left hand side of the Einstein equations. And then, of course, this implies by the Einstein equations themselves an identity of this form. So people at the beginning also thought, well, is this ener energy conservation? Yes, no, does it make sense? Well, it makes certainly sense of some, uh, of some sort, but to call this the energy and, and energy conservation is probably the wrong thing to do in GR. So maybe one more thing about that. So Noether's theorem, if you think of it a little bit more in a generalized way, well, what are we looking for? Within some setting of a Lagrangian theory, we always look for a um, continuous group of diffeomorph of transformations, which leave the Lagrangian invariant, right? So to such um, an object, we have then a quantity which is conserved. 
And in GR, the first, first problem, if you have a most general space-time, you don't have any symmetries. So what are you looking for if you don't have any symmetries at all? However, nature is usually better than just the most general case. For instance, if you look at an asymptotically flat space-time, your background Minkowski space has a lot of symmetries and you can start looking at maybe quasi um, uh, certain isometries you can preserve basically in, in, in a way or another in, in the manifold or control. Well, here is maybe one more slide where Einstein, Hilbert and Weil struggled over this energy components of the gravitational field. So they were thinking about this very hardly at the very beginning. And here's just one more quote by Hermann Weil. This is in his book, Space, Time and Matter of 1921. And he looks at um, these components here. So he says, well, nevertheless, it seems to be physically meaningless to introduce this TIK, so that's the Einstein pseudo tensor based on some specific Lagrangian he had there, as energy components of the gravitational field for these quantities are neither a tensor nor are they symmetric. So in fact, by choosing an appropriate coordinate system, all this TIK can be made to vanish at any given point. Also, the differential relations referring to the divergence of the Einstein pseudo tensor being zero are without the physical meaning. Nevertheless, by integrating them over an isolated system, one gets invariant conserved quantities. So you see there, there was a lot of thinking reflection about what the right energy notion should be. And already one suggestion is, oh, well, maybe we should integrate something over an isolated system. So that was already a good idea then. OK, but let's now jump to uh, more modern days. Well, modern 61. And so if we think of one type of uh, notion of energy and momentum, so this is the ADM energy, linear and angle momentum that is, um, was introduced in 1961 by Arnowitz, Deser and Misner. So basically, how this is the definition. But the way you think of this, you integrate these geometric objects basically at the sphere uh, over sphere at infinity, so you let r go to infinity, so you're in one space-like slice and you integrate basically over sphere at infinity and you can define then energy, linear and angular momentum in that way. So you have to say, of course, this, is, this holds for m many interesting asymptotically flat systems and so energy and linear momentum hold actually very generally and for angular momentum you need a little bit more of decay to be defined. So what about null infinity? Because I told you at the beginning, heuristically, so radiation, we would like to understand null infinity and explain something about radiation here, extract this from our space time. So we would like to understand the Cauchy problem and then see how the space time, the solution looks at null, uh, null infinity. So um, I can also foliate my space time, not only by, let's say, space-like hypersurfaces like this, I can also foliate my space-time by null hypersurfaces. So, and I all, I'm going to draw them like a cone. Of course, they have structure, but you can think of them as generalized light cones, for instance. So this is maybe u1. So you have this light, this null hypersurfaces, etc., that I can generate like that. And again, so when Gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. They travel along these null hypersurfaces out to null infinity, and that's what we are interested in. So if you, the Bondi definitions of, 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 the, of this, so the ADM definition that you just saw on the previous slide have something like an equivalent, well, have a <coughs> corresponding definition at null infinity, and we call this the Bondi definitions. So it goes back to Troutman, Bondi, Vanderburg, Metzner and Sachs in the 1950s and 60s to define mass, energy and momentum also at, at null infinity. Well, there's some more con constraints probably you have to put there to make things work. I'll, I'll say more about it. Um, a famous theorem, of course, in GR is that mass is positive. And so this was shown by Shane and Yao in 1981 and then also by Ed Witten separately. And then in the Bondi case, um, this was also studied by Shane and Yao later. So first of all, energy, what's now the real good way to talk about energy? So energy controls the curvature, first of all, but what kind of energy? So we use the Bell-Robinson tensor quite often. So here's one solution to, to this problem. So we can think of the Bell-Robinson tensor. So this is a 
defined as follows. So this is basically, it's a four covariant tensor field, but it's basically, if you look at that, it's a quadratic in the wild tensor. So you look at the wild tensor of your space time and Basically, the Bell-Robinson is a quadratic in your wild tensor. It has a lot of nice properties. It is actually um, positive in this sense that if you plug in future directed time like vectors, so you get this positivity property. And it also satisfies the Bianchi equations. So here's just a notation for what I use for the Hodge duals. Uh, maybe let me point out, so this was uh, used heavily in the work by Chrysodulu and Kleinemann on the um, Minkowski stability. So this is really the main object um, to, to control the curvature there. And nowadays in, in by many other people as well. So let me also intro introduce the current. So if k this q now, the Bell-Robinson tens are just introduced. So contract this now with three future directed causal vector fields and we obtain what we call the current in this case. So I'm going to call this J. That's my current. Then I can apply some divergent theorem on a bounded domain in the space time. And I can also then find what is my curvature flux. So if the omega here is just the, the boundary of this. So if this contains a portion of a null hypersurface, so we remember that. Um, with some affine tangent null vector field L, then the corresponding boundary term is indeed the curvature flux through this null hypersurface C. And we can write it down as like this integral. So this is the curvature flux we can define like that, associated to some null vector field L. So these are some important um, objects to think about. And often when you would like to proof, I'd say, control. So the Bell-Robinson tensor actually controls the curvature and from there we can um, go on. So maybe back to the Cauchy problem for one tiny moment. So if you look at initial data of, of this type, so I have not yet told you how much decay you need, etc., for certain questions. So if you look at Christodoulou Kleinemann's um, Minkowski stability proof and Sipser's generalization to Einstein-Maxwell case, so the initial data has this kind of form. So you look at the initial data where for large r, your g bar has a form like one over uh, one plus two m over r here, the first term, and it decays like, let's say, r to the minus three halves, and the corresponding decay is also for k with some, some regularity. And in my generalization of this result, so I have less decay. So I only have a decay of r to the minus one half here and some less regularity. And now you can ask, what do you need in order to see some interesting things in terms of radiation or memory effect? So it turns out, I mean, here you get all the information. And in fact, Christodoulou used exactly the last chapter of um, his book with Sergio to derive this nonlinear memory effect of gravitational waves. So not only you find um, the existence and uniqueness of solutions, you have a perfect description of how the asymptotic behavior looks like. Um, so in my case, well, I do see some things, you can compute a few things, but in order to get the full picture, this is kind of hidden in the uh, decay, which is very low, very slow decay here. Just a common question on notation. Subscript O subscript 3 means that's true for three derivatives of the uh, properties. Oh. Right, so I mean, with each derivative, you, you go down by one power of R. R or U, I mean, uh, well. So here are, let me also write down just the evolution equations, the constraints and the laps, just um, to give you an idea. So, I mean, we can then write down, we said the Einstein equations decouple into constraints and evolution equations. So phi is just my lapse function. So I have a equation to evolve the metric G bar given by this right hand side. I have an equation to evolve uh, the second fundamental form Kij. And so here, this is actually the R um, on each space like slice on, on the right hand side. And if I choose a maximal foliation, meaning that the trace of k is zero, so the constraint equations reduce to this set of equations. And in addition, I have an equation for the lapse of a maximal foliation here to look like that. So and again, so you can put this into hyperbolic form, etc., and uh, work with that. Now, let me also mention uh, just briefly the stability result by Chrysodulu and Kleinermann. So this was a, a big breakthrough, of course. Question is, can you find, can you perturb Minkowski space just a little bit to get a, a global solution which is um, geodesically complete um, for all time? So, and the, well, this is one very simple version of the theorem to state it fully. You need a few more pages, but you could say that every asymptotically flat initial data, which is globally close to Minkowski, 
uh, globally close in the sense with weighted sub OLF spaces, etc. Um, certain um, norms have to be small enough. So this gives you a solution which is a complete space time which is tending to Minkowski at infinity along any geodesic. So, and interesting enough, so again, so uh, I was just a few weeks ago, I spoke to a few physicists like um, Strominger at Harvard, and they now talk all about the Christodoulou Kleinerman space time. So they, um, they are at the moment very much looking at, they are looking for solutions which are exact, there's no approximation, anything. And it turns out, as I said before, so the last chapter of this book gives you the most precise information about some interesting physical space times. And of course, you can always try to, I mean, do approximations, etc. But it's interesting also to know uh, if you maybe relax, go um, do something else a little bit. How does does your solution really look like? So um, I mentioned the generalization by Sipser. Well, in my generalizations, there is you don't really see as much of radiation. You cannot really read these things off um, that well. There's many many people that I'm not citing. Everybody who have worked on related problems. So. Let me just say this is actually interesting for us because we get a precise description of null infinity and that's what I would like to stress also. Okay, maybe, well, just um, here on the blackboard I've already explained this, but we usually work with two type of foliations in, in this setting. So one is given by a space-like hypersurface, now it's called sigma here, which I call H on the blackboard, and also null hypersurfaces. So we will be interested in outgoing null hypersurfaces. And I, for simplicity, they look just like, like cones on my, on my uh, slide. Well, one thing again to remember, I use this, um, a maximal time function. The trace of this case is going to be zero. Each space-like slide is a complete Riemannian hypersurface with corresponding decay. And then I'm interested in the intersection of these. So when I intersect a space-like and a null hypersurface, I get, of course, a second, well, uh, as an object which is diffeomorphic to a sphere in this case, so STU is just the intersection of these. And it will be important in what comes. Also, let me just introduce a little bit more. So, I mean, I can look at the null vector field, generating null vector field L in the outgoing direction, and I call L bar <coughs> the one in the ingoing direction, and maybe this will be E4 later, and this will be E3. Then I can complement this with an orthonormal frame just on the surface S here. And I will actually um, decompose now my components, uh, my curvature and my geometric components with respect to such a foliation where this is given G of L and L bar is negative 2. Okay. And well, now let's look at, um, at the Bondi mass and something I mentioned before. This is going to be interesting for radiation. So if you look at one such null hypersurface, call it CU in our space time, and we let the time go to infinity, so we would like to see what happens to local quantities we define locally, what's the limit up there? So I can define what is called the Hawking mass, so quasi-locally, so I integrate over such a sphere basically, STU, what is the trace of chi and trace of chi bar, so what's that? So maybe I should introduce that as well. So. Um, two important objects when I draw this picture again that, well, you see me draw often. So if I have L and L bar, the generating vector fields in the null direction, so I can say, well, okay, I have the chi of x and y, so if x and y are in the tangent space here of this, of this S, so this is going to be given by g nabla x L and y, so it's a second fundamental form in the null, outgoing null direction, and I can look at the bar version, of course, doing the same thing, but with the ingoing null direction. So these are the corresponding second fundamental forms in the null direction. And interesting for us will be the shears. This will be the traceless parts of these objects. So by a hat, I just use um, this to call this the traceless part. And then, of course, I have the trace of these objects, which comes up in the definition here. So one way to write down the Hawking mass as an integral over quasi-locally over such a, such a surface is given like trace chi times trace chi bar, so the trace of these objects. And, well, it's given like that. Now, question. So for interesting space times, let me not be too specific at the moment. So this Hawking mass actually tends to Bondi mass when we go out to null infinity. So if you look at the blackboard over there, or here, we go out to null infinity. So then 
this is um, going to the what we call the Bondi mass. So it has a finite limit for the space times we are interested in. Now, what is future null infinity? We heuristically already introduced that. So I will call this I plus. So this is defined to be the endpoints of all the future directed null geodesics along which R goes to infinity. And it has just the topology of R cross S2 with the function U taking values in R. So you can think of the function U being parameterizing your null infinity. So, and our Bondi mass sits up here and is depending on U, of course. So each null hypersurface has a finite Bondi mass. Of course, if your space time is not, let's say, nice enough, this could blow up or not be defined. But in the cases we study here that I mentioned, so this is all finite and well defined. Okay, now the Bondi mass measures, so what does it do? So it measures, in this sense, the amount of mass which is remaining in an isolated system as measured at, at null infinity, at the given retarded time out here. So basically, if I say, well, out here, this is maybe Cu, which is hitting, well, this is null infinity for one such null hypersurface. So I have a certain amount, and we will also see the Bondi mass loss formula by saying, taking the derivative with respect to this function u. So this will give us how much radiation actually has happened. So here it is. So if you just look at Einstein vacuum, we don't care about other fields, just pure gravity is acting. So then we have the so-called Bondi mass loss formula. And again, this is something, this terminology is also used uh, I'm just copying the terminology of um, Sergio's book with Dimitri. So this is also in, in the setting there, derived and well understood. So you have a Bondi mass loss formula. So you take the derivative and on the right hand side, you have this Xi object is actually now the limit of one of these shears. So this shear um, with the, the barred version. So you sit on one Cu, let T go to infinity and you take the limit. So this is what is called Xi of u. And correspondingly, this other guy has a limit as well. So let me just write it down because it will show up. <coughs> so this is called sigma then. So these are objects at null infinity. So I explained this already. So we have the second fundamental form. So this is the traceless part, which gives us the shears. Then we have also the torsion we can identify. So I I told you that already, so let's skip further. Now, what is gravitational radiation? Now, I gave you a setup of, of, of well, the, the space times we are looking at, but gravitational radiation is now a fluctuation of the curvature of your space time. So your space time has a lot of structure in terms of Riemannian curvature, etc. And so when a gravitational wave travels from the source, so it's changing the, the curvature of the space time. So it's like a wave packet that may come for, let's say, one second traveling through. Um, that's how we think of it. And now we would like to see what we can learn about it. Okay, also, let me also mention the so-called memory effect for the moment. So, okay, we have heard about LIGO and LIGO looks like an L shape. It's an L shape detector. So this is the same distance like here and have a 90 degree angle. And if you for simplicity assume now that the gravitational wave source is coming from the third perpendicular direction, so then it acts like a planar wave out here. So the wave will, so it, of course it hits from different angles, but in order to simplify the discussion here, so let's assume it comes from this direction, perpendicular. So what will happen is that these masses will move in the, pla in the plane, because it's like a planar wave when it hits our uh, detectors on Earth. So these masses will move and what they were able to measure in this experiment is really uh, by laser interferometry you measure the distance of let's say mass 1 from 0, mass 2 from 0. This is where actually you, you have a beam splitter here and by laser interferometry you measure the distance. And of course when the curvature is changing the distance, the space time is changing and it reflects in the displacement of these test masses. So your, the test masses you can think of they are <coughs> floating on their geodesics. So you see what the geodesics are doing by looking at the test masses. So, okay, so they were able to measure these instantaneous displacements during the time of the pass by of this wave. Now you can ask what happens afterwards. And this has not yet been detected, but let's hope in the near future maybe. So what you think is, in, in maybe in most cases, you would think, oh, well, things go back to their geodesics as before and everything looks the same. 
Now, there is a prediction called the memory effect saying, no, this will not happen. It will happen. It will be that the space time will be permanently changed and the, spa uh, the test masses will be um, permanently displaced for that matter. So this is what is called the memory effect of gravitational waves. And well, there are various studies. Many people have in the meantime worked on that. So let me maybe just say a little bit about it. So in the linearized version of or linearized theory of the Einstein equations, the first people to find such an effect were Soldovich and Polnareff in, in the 70s. And then in a fully nonlinear problem uh, setting that was Dimitri who really used the last chapter of the Minkowski stability book of his and Sergius to, I mean, you plug in the null asymptotics also are true for large data, one can show. So he f f um, derived from all that, he derived the so-called nonlinear memory <coughs> effect. So people called it linear, nonlinear, and it was, uh, so the first effect was supposed to be so small, never to be detected. But then um, this effect is actually large enough, it's also small, but large enough to be detected, hopefully. And so people always thought this is really a linear and a nonlinear thing of, of the same, same uh, effect as memory. But um, it turns out, so with Garfinkel, we looked at that and we, um, we found that these are two different effects, which have to do with the linear one we call regular. So this has to do with one portion of the wild curvature, so the one portion of the electric part of the wild curvature changing over time. And the null or formally nonlinear effect has to do with fields that really go out to null infinity. So things that change null infinity. So these are two different things. And we found this also in the linear Maxwell equations, two equivalent, well, not displacements, but kicks. So anyway, so you can ask, well, what do electromagnetic fields do or neutrinos? So they will actually um, add to this second effect, which we call null effect now. Well, many people have worked on that. There is work by Blanchy, Damour, Braginsky, Grishkuk, Thorne, and many people I'm actually probably missing, but it's interesting that recently Schrominger and collaborators kind of um, also took up the, um, this work on memory. And so they have the idea that the memory effect is actually part of a triangle where they look at word identities and BMS super translations. And now a lot of people are looking for memory effects in other field theories, like, um, in ADS, CFT and uh, anything you can think of. So it seems that there's something interesting, but maybe not, uh, it's a, just the beginning of understanding of, of what this means in other theories. Okay, well, there are two types of memory. And let me now um, come back to the Riemannian curvature. If you think of, let me decompose this a little bit and kind of lay open the structure of radiation I would like to show you. So again, three denotes just, um, E3 is just the ingoing null um, vector field I write down here and E4 is the outgoing null vector field. So if I'm just in the Einstein vacuum equation, so the Riemann curvature is my wild curvature and I decompose here the curvature components with respect to this foliation. Now the most interesting part to remember is this alpha bar. So there's a part which goes like 1 over r, the tau minus you can think of like u, so it's 1 plus u squared, square root. So there's a part that goes like 1 over r, and this will be the interesting part um, for us for radiation. So, and again, you can look at different space times and see what happens with this. So if you stay within the so-called christodoulou kleinemann space times, you will see, well, the alpha bar part has a limit at null infinity. I call this capital A of u. And this is a symmetric trace free two covariant tensor field on the sphere at null infinity. Other components also have certain behavior. I'm not going to look at that. But if you change the type of space time and you do another Cauchy problem to really understand fully what's happening at null infinity, so then you can do more general settings. And so with um, Garfinkel, we also came up with a different method. So uh, the most rigorous way to study that is, of course, to do the Cauchy problem for each set of initial data you have. Well, this can be cumbersome if you're just interested, let's say, in the radiation. So we have a, another method, which is an approximation by uh, perturbing the wild curvature, which is gauge invariant, to actually, for more general space times, also look at radiation at null infinity. Okay, maybe here is just one short note on one of these methods. So Christel and Kleinemann actually introduced an interesting set, uh, an interesting theory looking at, let's say, elliptic equations on such a surface and then propagating along null or space-like directions. So if you look at the trace of chi with, an affi with a parameter s in the null direction, 
So this is given by on the right hand side, we have some the shear squared, we have the trace of chi, and then this is now just anything, if you plug in an Einstein null, a null fluid, so this comes from the energy momentum tensor on the right hand side. And this comes, if you have Einstein-Maxwell equations, this would be a component of the electromagnetic field. So in general, when you look at the Gauss equation, how do these things look like? So I can write down the curvature of this intersection I call STU in terms of as follows. So I have the trace chi, chi bar on the right hand side. I have here the product of the shears plus W I call just a component of the wild curvature and contribution from T. So I have either quadratics in shear or trace of chi, one pure component of Weil, other than the alpha bar. Alpha bar is the one with, with least decay. Or contribution from the T on the right hand side. So, and if I look at the null Kodatsi equations in this notation, so we can define what we call a, ma a mass aspect function or its conjugate. So theta is just a torsion, so this is um, given again of this structure. And that we can write this with help of the Gauss equation. <coughs> we can actually write this um, mass aspect function like this. And now if you look at the null Kodatsi and the co corresponding conjugate Kodatsi equations, so they have a form like that. So you have either quadratics of Ricci coefficients on the right hand side, or a derivative of one of those. Here's another quadratic, or a pure component of, of, of curvature, but not alpha bar, not the worst decay and contributions from T, if any. So um, I already told you about the limits, maybe let me skip that. So the limits again, so chi hat and chi hat bar, the shears have limits like on the left blackboard here at null infinity. Now the structure, let me introduce a little bit more about the structure. So if psi is a component of second fundamental form or torsion, phi is a component of the wild curvature and T just energy momentum. So then you can write down and n is just um, now a normal into to s into the in the space like slice. So you have a structure of the equations when you look at the propagation here for chi hat. So you have a quadratic again in psi or a derivative of such a psi term. And we have just curvature or t itself. And eta hat is actually the chi bar over there, chi bar hat. So similar for the other equation. If you look at this type of equations and take limits, now I would like to understand what happens at null infinity. So let us multiply by the r that is needed. And then we see on the right hand side, so alpha bar has a limit which is called a. So we get, for these equations, we get limits actually for many different space times, this is actually true, that the behavior at null infinity, so we have this behavior between the shear, so we take a derivative with respect to u. And one shear here is um, given related to the curvature at null infinity, which is the one over r part of the curvature. Now energy radiated, so we can say, well, in the pure Anson vacuum case, so the energy radiated is integrated from minus to plus infinity. Maybe let me show this here. So if you are in pure Einstein vacuum, you only have this shear part. But if you add electromagnetic fields, you have a contribution from the electromagnetic field or one portion. And if you have, let's say, neutrinos that you can model by as some null fluid, you would also get a positive contribution to this energy which is radiated away. And this is, so we integrate this from minus to plus infinity at null infinity. Okay, here is a, maybe a theorem just generally. I mean, in the Einstein vacuum case, you can just forget about the S, but so what happens if you have different fields in the Einstein, vacu in the Einstein equations? So we can say that this sigma, so the shears of this chi hat over here, so this is the, the limit of this shear, so it has limits at plus and uh, minus infinity for u, so this has limits. And this will be related to this permanent change of your space time after gravitational wave has passed. And well, S is now be any tensor or function which depends on the fields with the right decay, and T will denote any lower order components of the energy. Uh, stress energy tensor. Well, the, what the theorem says, well, we also have some um, function phi, which is a solution of the following. So we have f minus its mean value f bar over a sphere at infinity. And this strange notation means this is just at the sphere at infinity. And <coughs> then this difference sigma, sigma minus is given by this equation. So in other words, um, the radiation here, or what is radiated away, this energy 
comes into the difference of this shears at null infinity and this is directly related to some displacement of test masses. So maybe let me skip the ideas of the proof and do something else so you can prove this. You need some uh, to investigate some Hodge systems locally and then go to null infinity and take the limits of these and see what happens out there. Um, well now it can be shown that for now we are still in asymptotically flat space times so the permanent displacement if I write this down again you remember from before so maybe here so if you have test masses of this type and a gravitational wave comes and travels through so now the claim is and this is not a Laplacian this is just a delta the claim is that the permanent displacement is given by this right hand side and you see this right hand side is this difference of the shears at null infinity that I just developed in the theorem and in the theorem this is linked to the energy irradiated away which is then sourced in the pure gravitational case it's sourced by, sourced by the limit of this psi so of this null um, second fundamental form here and if you have extra fields like electromagnetic or neutrinos they will actually add to that <coughs> Okay, and so there is also something called the ordinary memory, that's what people thought was the linear memory bef before, so and this is now a completely different thing, so the null memory is what the big portion of this permanent uh, displacement actually is. And well maybe here very briefly how does it actually now relate to experiments, so we have um, well, by really studying the Cauchy problem and looking at the null infinity, so we can really derive a lot of geometric or analytic information, but how does this now reflect uh, anything in the experiment? Well, if I set up an experiment, so let's think of three geodesics in space, Tom, and denote them by gamma zero, one, and two, so just the uh, geodesics on which my, my particles are floating, and well, T is my future unit time vector field sitting at uh, gamma zero and then I'm looking what's happening uh, at what's happening. So I look at this geodesic, so I introduce an orthonormal frame field so I can construct the frame field along the gamma zero geodesic and well I can then set things up so that I can measure nicely what's happening with the distance between one and zero and two and zero. Now I can well under certain circumstances I can replace the geodesic by the Jacobi equation and I have two derivatives on the left hand side which give me a Riemannian curvature component on the right uh, here interacting contracting with XL and interesting enough so depending everything is really sitting in this Riemannian curvature component so you really need to understand the Cauchy problem how your space time looks like to really understand what's happening here and the interesting thing is maybe let me also add now a null geodesic um, or a null fluid so basically your team you knew is some positive uh, function here um, k i k j or, or k is a null vector and looking at the twice contracted Bianchi identities if I plug in a null, null fluid so we have shown that well this null fluid will also contribute the Einstein equations for a null fluid are used just to this equation here so the space time rich is given by some constant times the energy momentum tensor where the null fluid is sitting. Now if you look at the portion of this null fluid which has let's say the right decay behavior so it decays like one of r squared and something in u and we'd like to understand how is now the Riemann curvature related to this portion of the null fluid which comes in through the right side of the Einstein equations. Well we know that the Riemann curvature can be decomposed into the traceless um, part which is the Wall curvature and we have Ricci curvature and scalar curvature here and so well if we plug everything in and we look at the let's say worst components we find zero is just a t element so we find that well if you look at that well we have some component in the pure wild curvature but also through the Ricci coming from the null fluid if you look at the Ricci component we go and look at the corresponding Einstein null fluid on the right hand side so which component we plug in the worst components and we use an null foliation again and when we plug everything in and go back to the null L and L bar notation we can see well there's two things that happen first of all I have this alpha bar curvature which is going like 1 over R I can define the limit and write it down like this and I have this component of the null fluid which goes like 1 over R squared so we'll say well wait a minute so we have 1 over R in the curvature and 1 over R squared here so it does not contribute so this is lower order 
So it's true for the instantaneous displacement. So when the gravitational wave is traveling through, so this is indeed lower order for that. But it turns out that for the cumulative effect afterwards, the memory, this is actually of the same order. How does that uh, work? So let me write down, OK, I have maybe two more minutes. So let me write down the second derivative here in the Jacobi equation again. On the right hand side, I now this is the, the, the notation for the curvature component at null infinity, the 1 over r square, r component. So now we have this nice relation between the shear and the curvature. And we know also that the lemus of this psi goes to zero when u is very large. So this means that if you have tests, so here we have just, if you plug this in, this means that if you integrate here once or you substitute, this means that the velocity will be zero after the gravitational wave train has passed. So something happens, but for large u, the velocity will be zero. So they go back to rest. I substitute twice here, the shears, and plug that into this equation. And when we take the full limit, I get exactly what I told you before. Namely, this displacement here, which is this permanent displacement, is given by the difference of these shears, which again, hidden behind the right hand side, is this energy which is radiated away. So what exactly contributes from the space time? What exactly contributes to, to, this, um, to this displacement? OK, maybe I should say one more word just at the, at the end. So with uh, Garfinkel, we studied also cosmological space times. The question is, if you are in a cosmological setting, are these things still there? How do they interfere? Or how would, for instance, the cosmological constant come in? So does this play any role? So we look at Friedman limit Robertson Walker plus De Sitter. So with positive cosmological constant, and we found for the De Sitter space time, so we can write down the metric like that. So the De Sitter space time models the, basically the inflation period of the universe. So that's one way to think about it. So in that case, we found in De Sitter that, well, there is a factor 1 plus r h0, the Hubble radius, which or the Hubble constant, so which is giving you um, an enhancement uh, um, of this memory effect. So the memory effect is multiplied by this factor, so it becomes bigger. Something, something similar, maybe I jump through that to the very end, but something similar you can say for the FLRW case. So we, this is work in progress, we're writing it up, but for FLRW, which is modeling basically our present universe, so you can also see that this memory will be enhanced by um, such a factor. So maybe I stop here, thank you. Thank you. Does the area, I mean, is there a lasting effect on the area of that triangle? Pardon? Right, you drew a triangle. Ah, yeah. So first of all, let me maybe make this a little bit more precise. So if, if oh yeah, exactly. So if I have just a circle, and the, the wave is hitting from here, so what it does, basically, it's kind of stretching and squeezing it, right? So it's like a planar wave, so this is what it does. And you can think of this like, well, I pick points on that. And now the, the claim is that with the memory, so you would have, this has a certain, well, displacement in this direction, this is by 90 degrees in the other direction, so this will be permanently displaced. And then you can actually compute what the angle would be, but, eh, what the, the area would be. But it's not clearly bigger or smaller, is it? Right? Uh, not really, I think. Maybe you could compute that. So what means after LIGO, they saw that uh, they saw their one signal, now they have to recalibrate their machine. Well, that's actually the problem. So this memory is at low frequency. And also what they saw in, let's say, if you look at the, the, the strength of the signal they saw, let's say the delta lambda over lambda is like 10 to the minus 21 of what they saw. Now there's a paper pro proposing to, to measure memory with LIGO that just came out a few weeks ago. So they proposed something like at the order 10 to the minus 22. <laughs> and also all the noise that you can think of is at low frequency for LIGO. So it's probably not the best way to look for it, but nevertheless, so some people are proposing to do that and they, they have um, so some kind of a filter they, pu they put there. So I don't know, they are improving the instruments. So in space, I mean, yeah, right. But I mean, the, the way, absolutely. I mean, the, way, the, way, the place to look for that would be the space um, project that um, the NASA and ESA has been uh, working on. And I think the Pathfinder was launched by the European uh, group. And so in space, this would be this easy, well, easy. Technical details now modulo, modulo those out. So this would be really easier to see there, also with the frequency and no noise. 
Okay. Uh, uh, could, could you say a little bit more about what you meant by, by uh, that there is a memory effect even for Maxwell's theory? Ah, uh, yeah. So actually, we thought about, um, we, we looked at the pure Maxwell equations, which are linear, of course. And there, there's some, um, if you take, let's say, Jackson and take one of the formulas, play around, so you get easily, you get easily what we call, what is called the linear, what we call the ordinary memory. So, and this would not be a permanent displacement, but you could think instead, here, these masses are not charged, it's just test masses following the geodesics. But what you would do for the Maxwell case is you have charged test masses and you would get an overall uh, velocity after the passage of an electromagnetic wave, so a kick. And so we found the ordinary thing, and we also found a null kick, which is then, again, bigger and corresponds to the null memory here, actually. And that's for the pure classical Maxwell equations. Of course, you can now ask, what about QED? Well, one thing seems to be there, the other we don't understand yet. Okay, some more questions? Well, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.